welcome to this podcast by the Care Quality Commission. In this episode, we're going to explore sexual safety and supporting people accessing care to have relationships and express their sexuality. My name is Stefan Kelly, and I'm an Inspection Manager for Adult Social Care here at the CQC. And I'm also very proud and feel privileged to have been part of the group leading on this topic within the organization. We published our report promoting sexual safety through empowerment in February this year, and today we'll discuss this report, updating you on the recommendations in it. Today I'm very pleased to be joined by Jim Thomas, who's Program Head for Workforce Innovation at Skills for Care, and Debbie Ivanova, Deputy Chief Inspector of Adult Social Care here at CQC. So welcome and thank you for joining us today. Let's start by introducing who you are and why this topic is important to you, and I shall make a start. So I'm currently the Inspector Manager for the Blackpool and Northwest Lancashire team in adult social care. And by background, so that's my life before CQC, I'm an autism practitioner, and that's still very much an area I'm passionate about. And as CQC earlier this year, we published our refreshed guidance on right support, right care, right culture. And that very much outlines the need for people's choice, control, independence, inclusion, and ultimately their rights to be promoted in services for autistic people and learning disability services. And I've had the pleasure of being involved in the development of that guidance. And for me, it links very closely with our work to promote sexual safety through empowerment. Because I think understanding, respecting and empowering people's sexuality and safety, and ultimately improving their quality of life, that's a really essential part for me of working towards much more proactive support for people that really starts with the person. So on to Jim. Hi, thank you, Stefan. Um, so for me, this is important because actually I, I think uh, sexuality and, and personal relationships are a fundamental part of being a human being. Um, whether you are you gay, straight, trans, whether you have a physical disability, a learning disability, mental health needs, um, whether you're 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, and younger than that. One of the things we never lose in life is, is, is our sexuality. Um, it changes um, over time. Um, uh, things change with the generations, but, but it, it, it's, it's a really important part of, of, of being human, how we define who we are as, as in the individuals, um, and how we have confidence in who we are as a person um, at, at many, many times across all aspects of our life. And even if you are, if you need care and support, um, then, then that doesn't take away your, your, your feelings, your, your sense of being around who you are, um, your sexuality and your need for personal relationships. Thanks, Jim. Debbie? Hi, I'm Debbie Evenover, and this is a, a subject that's been really important to me for, for many years. Um, my experience of working in and running learning uh, services for people with learning disabilities, I know it's been a live issue for for a period of time. Well, I've been in I've been in the field for 30 years, so for a long time this has been an issue, and it isn't being addressed enough. People don't feel able to be open enough about their sexuality and staff don't feel confident enough to respond um, and this can really lead to people's needs not being met or more seriously sexual abuse not being identified so it's a really important topic for me and I'm um, absolutely delighted that we're now um, trying to get this addressed and really support the work we're doing. Great thanks so much everyone. So this first question is for you Debbie. In the CQC report we've heard from some hugely courageous families who wanted to tell their story. So was this what made CQC decide to look at this aspect of care and, and what did you find? Yes, Stefan, that's right. I mean, this report started from some really distressing stories from families who wanted to tell us about times when the safeguards to protect their loved one in, in services had failed. We wanted to make sure that those stories helped to encourage people and staff to know that they can disclose sexual incidents and are fully supported when they do so. 
But on the other side, we also had heard from people who wanted support so that they could have relationships and, and, and be supported to express their sexuality. And so we wanted to also highlight the need for more open conversations about supporting people, accessing care to have those relationships and to express their sexuality. When we actually did the work, what we found was that people were not always having those needs associated with their sexuality or their desire to have their sexual relationships recognised. So we really, really felt that more needed to be done to understand and meet those needs. We also found that where people don't have the opportunity to talk about this openly and where staff are afraid of having those conversations, that it was much more difficult to pick up the signs when something was wrong. So people were both starting to learn or, sh or, or show, show behaviours that were not helpful within the setting that they lived. So some overtly sexual behaviours that were staff were having more difficulty coping with. And also people weren't picking up where there were signs that some of the those people may have experienced some form of sexual abuse. What I do want to say though as well is that Whilst some of the incidents we found were devastating and life-changing for those families and shocking to read, they weren't common. Really important point to make. And I think, like you said, it's a, such an important piece of work for us. And of course, it's still a very important issue now as we, as we really promote and drive this forward with the pressures of COVID. Well, I think it's all about person-centred care, isn't it? And if you think about COVID, I think what's happened is that's become even more important. Um, We've had a, a period of time where there's been lots of instructions, lots of ways of dealing with things that focus on um, how the service is run, how it operates. And it would be very easy during this period of time to forget that people have individual needs. And there's lots and lots of things that, that we need to keep addressing and saying, actually, these things haven't gone away. We still have all of these individual needs and sexual needs are one of those. What I think because people haven't been having that contact with families, because they haven't been having the contact with social workers, advocates in the same ways that they normally would and with the community uh, at, at large, there has been some uh, services becoming much more closed and some closed cultures developing, which which means that actually many more people are not having um, that real personal individualised care that they need. So. COVID has made this even more important, if anything, um, and that culture of openness that we really want to encourage and really want people to have, um, that needs to be the focus of how services operate to make sure all these things are addressed well. Absolutely. Thanks, Debbie. So my role in this journey is very much to help make our recommendations happen. And like you've just mentioned, it's, it's really opening up cultures, but almost expected to be talking about these things. I know, Jim, you mentioned that as well. And tackling the taboo and opening up those conversations is part of our recommendations. And we've highlighted in our recommendations that a lack of awareness of good practice and sexual safety and sexuality can place people at real risk of harm. We as CQC and the regulator, we've got a strong role in making sure that people using services are protected and supported. And that means we want to promote a culture to be developed where people and staff feel empowered, of course, to talk about sexuality and raise concerns around safety. And we can't do that without great system and partnership working. So, Jim, could you tell us a bit more about your new guidance and how that came about and who, who it's for? So, so the guidance um, actually started out about five or six years ago when a small number of social care providers down in the southwest uh, came to Skills for Care and said to us, um, you've got fantastic resources on so many different things. Why have you got nothing about personal relationships and sexuality? And I, I must admit, I was really surprised that, that, that they came to us and asked us about that because um, I'd actually been around in the early 1990s where there was masses of learning and development done in, in, in social care around personal relationships, sexuality, and sexual safety. Um, and I, I'd, I'd assumed that, that that was carrying on and everything had been solved and, and there wasn't really anything to talk about in this area. How wrong was I? You know, um, so, so we, we, we got a small group together of, 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 of commissioners and social care employers and people with lived experience and said, okay, 
if we're going to develop some some guidance around this, what does it need to contain? What does it need to look like? And what are the fundamental things that need to be a part of that? And and, and one of the things that came across really clearly in that was was about how we value people, how we respect difference, how we empower and enable people to be safe. And at the same time, we ensure that we no allow our own prejudices to impact on 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 people and their perspectives on 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 their own understanding of personal relationships and sexuality. So so we developed some guidance which we which we published initially two or three years ago, um, and and then about eighteen months ago, colleagues at CQC came to us and said. We like your guidance, but we think it could be better. And here's some work we're doing. Do you think you could work with us to develop that further? Um, and at the same time as as, as, as you doing that, a, a little organisation called Supported Loving came to me and said, we like your guidance too, but we think we could make it better. So so working with, with yourselves, um, working with employers, working with Supported Loving, th this new guidance is, is, is a refinement and a development of, of, of what we what we did before um, and it's about very much really building on that idea of values respect understanding difference enabling and empowering people to lead different lives and understand how sexuality and personal relationships is different for different people and at the same time um, being able to with confidence recognize that when you are living within some kind of system there may be checks and balances on, on on your ability to be able to lead an ordinary life that are slightly different to out there in the real world and it's how do we mitigate for some of those things as well where you're a vulnerable person absolutely and it's been really great working with you and, and supported loving on uh, on those training materials and and, and a great piece of partnership working and i think you've you've touched on something that is it's just really putting yourselves in the shoes of other people and and understanding how their their thinking and their perception of situations might be different to your own so the person might be saying things and and just really un using your understanding of of the person like debbie said that real person-centered care you know this what what is that frame of expectation for that person is that all that person's ever known and and actually how de how they experiencing things is is a good starting point and i know that um when i've been speaking with with providers and services for example um, around the experiences of lgbt plus people uh, which i know you mentioned mentioned jim um there's been some very interesting conversations i've had because we know from lgbt plus people that many of them are absolutely terrified of having to move into a care home because and 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 this is this is a quote i feel like i might have to go back into the closet and of course you know like you're saying and really supporting and embracing people's sexuality and empowering them to be themselves to be safely themselves is so important um, and i've come across some different approaches and and sometimes it's subtle messages that really let people know you're welcome to be yourself here safely and it's not necessarily question in an in, in, in initial assessment but i've seen for example messages and, and rainbow flags and love is love around care homes but when we're thinking about outstanding what do we what do we think outstanding looks like in sexual safety or freedom for people who use adult social care services i think that that bit you were just talking about about um outstanding care is about supporting people to live full lives which is about not just meeting needs but about also meeting their aspirations has to be at the bottom of outstanding care and that's exactly the same whether that's looking at um, sexual needs or looking at other needs for that person and actually what does it mean to this person to want to be able to live a full life taking account and recognizing their value as an individual and to do that um, I think those the best services we can come back to that word again that empowerment word because I think that's really kind of core mm -hmm. so it's services where the the culture of a culture of openness 
and empowerment. So people being really able to talk about and express their needs, people feeling that they are going to be recognized and valued as individuals when they do so. That has to be led by management. Management have to lead that and they have to train and support their staff to be able to do this. This comes naturally to some people, but not to everybody. And you can learn and you can put in place for staff a really good support network that helps them to do that and helps them to do that in a way that you know will will really make sure that people feel both well protected against sexual violence and abuse, but also empowered to express their sexuality and have those needs fully met. So we've seen some great examples, I think, when we were doing this about people who were um, enabled to live their lives together, to actually be able to have a full relationship and, and, and were working towards marriage, where we also saw people who um, were able to talk for the first time in their whole life about their sexuality and what that meant to them and about relationships that they'd had in the past they've never been able to really talk about so outstanding care is where that's enabled to happen i think absolutely and i think you know just to to pick up on the point of empowerment both empowerment and protection are equally parts of of safeguarding principles and you know, therefore they do go hand in hand so it's quite important that we that we look at those jim was there anything you wanted to say about outstanding I think, you know, at its simplest level, it's being able to have open and honest conversations about sexuality um, and where organisations, families, staff, people with lived experience are able to have those open and honest conversations. And that also means um, saying, I don't know what that means. What do you mean by, by, by that? Um, I'll give you an example. So, so a number of years ago, uh, I used to run training courses on personal relationships and sexuality. And the icebreaker we used to, to, to do with people was, um, we'd say, okay, we want you to write down every single word you can ever think of to do with sexuality and personal relationships. And we spent about the first two hours of this one day course, just literally writing all these words down giggling about them, being honest with each other about things we didn't know. Um, and, and I'd recommend to any any staff group is, you know, take some time to write down all of the words you can think about with personal relationships and sexuality, the positive stuff, the negative stuff and everything in between. And just test out with each other which of those words you really understand. And if none of you understand exactly what the word is, Go and look it up and, and, and talk about that and, and, and just have some conversations because if you can do that, then you're on the way to being outstanding by actually being able to have free and open conversations. You'd be surprised how many things I learned during that exercise. Every time we did it, I learned something new. So what if people don't want to talk about their sex life? Do you know, I think it's a really interesting one, this, because that was always the reason that um, I was given by providers for not addressing this issue. So I think there's two things I'd want to say. The first thing is it's not good enough to put this issue in a too difficult to discuss box. Um, and it's particularly because these topics are sensitive and complex that they shouldn't be ignored. So using people don't want to talk about it is 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 in my in, in my book. We've got to first of all really get under that. Is that right? Is the people really been given the opportunity? Has your service been portrayed to them and and um, um, in, in a way that this is a place where we look at everyone's needs. Is this, is this talked about right from the beginning of somebody coming into the service? You know, so have you done the groundwork before you can say, actually, they don't want to talk about it? But of course, a person-centred approach to care will mean being respectful and understanding of the specific needs of each individual. And there will be some people who don't want to discuss their sex life. Absolutely. But I think it's important that people are given that opportunity in a really meaningful way right from the beginning, that that culture set up, you know, we're going to talk about things we're going to give you that opportunity right from the word go and then you'll find as you develop the relationship with the person who's living in the service that they will feel able to confide and explain what 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 it what they need to have their needs really met so back to the open culture a bit again for me here absolutely and i i always reflect there on myself um so I always say, whenever I meet the new person, it's like a new coming out for myself. Um, and I always thought, if I was, to, if I had to move into a care home, would I come out straight away? Mm -hmm. What would my, what would influence that? Because I think 
you need to feel at ease and, and it's not 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 that you don't trust people but i think you know, you need to feel in a safe environment jim was there anything you wanted to add with regards to yeah. people who might not want to talk about I, their sex life i think i think both of you are apps uh, absolutely right and and it comes back to the thing we've said between us now it, it's we mustn't make the assumption that people wouldn't want to talk about this but we also have to respect the the people may need to feel confident to be able to discuss different issues around personal relationships and sexuality with us and i think it brings me back to something in the guidance which is about um human rights and, there, and there's two bits of, of, of human rights that, that really stand out for me. The first is um, um, a right to consens consensual sexual expression in private. And the second human right, which is Article 10, which is around freedom of expression and the right to receive information, including the public right to know. How can you really, really understand um, some of these things? if you've actually never been given the information to really understand why is it i feel like why am i why am i attracted to men rather than to women why am i um if nobody's ever explained that to you or given you an opportunity the information to be able to really work that out for yourself how can you how can you really really honestly say that you, you your, your 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 human rights around personal relationships and sexuality are being respected absolutely and i think um raising that awareness through staff training as well as that as debbie said you know managers will definitely lead that lead service leaders and and providers will will lead this but it's it's really instilling that confidence in, in staff through training and you gave some brilliant examples didn't you jim to to give that background and underpinning knowledge but also just to promote that ease of asking those questions and it's yeah. that that openness so the challenge now is to keep the conversation going so what's next for cqc and skills for care so the guidance comes out in the next week or so and then once the the guidance is out um we want to make sure as many people as possible get an opportunity to to see that to have a opportunity to look at that and to think about how that can support them with workforce development in, in, in all of the different places they work, live um, and are supported. Um, we're just about to start together um, a piece of work where we're going to look at all of the existing learning and development that's out there around personal relationships and sexuality and to think about what works well, what doesn't work so well, what works in different environments for different people, different cultures, etc, etc. So any examples that people might have around that please do do let us know what we want to do is once we've got that better understanding of what's already out there is we're going to curate that to be able to kind of help people find things that are relevant to the particular thing that they're wanting to explore so if you're looking for some learning and development resources around perhaps say different cultural needs or, or different sexual preferences or sexuality in relation to living in different kinds of environments how can we curate some of the learning that's out there to make it easy for you to find the things that are useful to you and then once we've done that it is to say is there anything else that that isn't covered by all this plethora of things that are out there that we ought to develop are there some additional training modules that, that we really think that 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 don't exist that we need to develop um, so that we've got a broad range of everything out there for people in different places to, to use at different times in different ways. Thanks, Jim. Debbie? So I think it'll be really important that, that our staff are enabled also to feel confident to deal with this topic when they're out on inspections. So we're looking at what support they'll need to do that, some training for our staff, some guidance about how to ask the right questions, about how to raise this as a topic on their inspections too. But we will be expecting them to follow it up and to see what services are doing and to look for some really good practice that we can share with other people around that. And then giving a, people a bit of a time to actually put this into into place and implement it, we'll, we'll go back again and we'll have another look and see how have people done? How well have we actually managed to address this issue and tackle it? Have we at last managed to move this issue on, which we've waited such a long time to really get established into our care homes? And I'm really hopeful that if we can be confident with dealing with this issue, that 
people in the sector will be confident with dealing with this issue and those people for whom it matters most, the people who are using our services, will be confident to actually explain and articulate their needs and have them listened to, met and supported. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And absolutely, as uh, as a manager within my teams, I'll keep those conversations going. And as someone who's had many of those um, conversations with, with previous staff teams around how to promote um, that sexual safety and, and empower people with um, a learned disability or autistic people, I'm, I'm really happy to have those conversations. And I think as, as a group driving this, um, that's really something that we're aiming to do as well. Fantastic. This, this has been great. Thank you again for joining us and sharing your views here today. Thank you, Stefan. <laughs> Thank you. You can find our Promoting sex Sexual Safety through Empowerment Report on the CQC website at www.cqc.org.uk. And you will also find the latest guidance from Skills for Care on their website, www.skillsforcare.org.uk. Thanks to those listening as well. Keep an eye out for more opportunities to be part of this conversation through our digital participation platform, Citizen Lab. And there's a link to that in the episode description. We've lots of CQC podcasts coming up, so join us next time. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.